so the um, Israel occupation forces with US weapons do this. They shoot you and then inside Israel they arrest you, put you in jail and keep you as long as, as you want as you want. So they you know, being an activist, well actually I thought I was gonna speak for about ten, fifteen minutes and I think I'm gonna speak for longer than this. So being an activist is actually being made very difficult. But the good thing is there's still quite a lot of us around. So so why? Why even if you know there's this repression, this propaganda, why are there still people around? And I think it's because you know becoming alive, becoming an activist, is sort of really a way of thinking. So it wasn't planned. It's really a way of thinking, and it becomes sort of a, a way of, of life even. And I think it's a very rewarding one. Like, look, when was the last time you really felt empowered and, and alive? Was it when you bought your last computer, iPad, <coughs> iPhone, when you bought a car, if you have a car? Was it when you got your first credit card? Was it when you watched, got drunk watching football with your friend? Or was it when you stood with like 20,000 of your you know, fellow students? outside parliament, you know, demonstrating for your rights against police brutality, against the government policies? Was it when you had a four hours meeting, like debating what's the best strategy to go forward? What can we do this? How can we do this? And then finally after these four hours you get like a, you know, a very solid proposal and you feel empowered by this. Was it when you walked with 200 Palestinians, Israelis, internationals, walking towards the wall in Bilain, ch chanting la la, al jida la la. When was the f last time you really felt alive? Yeah, I guess the answer is probably when you stood with 20,000 students in front of parliament and not when you played Tetris on your iPod. And, and, uh, and that's what activism is. That's what activism is, being part of the world. It's being alive. You know, we're only here for a very short period of time. And even if science made progress and stuff, we might live you know, to 100 years old and stuff, we're gonna die one day. And we're here for a very short period of time. And that's what life should be about, you know, solidarity, standing for the oppressed, standing for your rights. And more than anything, because I think activism can be very, it's just simply not, shut, not to shut up. Don't shut up if you don't agree. If like eight people agree and you disagree, you know, make your voice heard. And that's, that's what it is. And also don't let people put you down with, it's never happened before. You can't do anything about it. Look at the world, you know. That's what people tell me, you know, like, you know, and your parents, what are you doing, activist? I was an activist when I was 20. I was the leftist, I was in May 68. But look, the world is what it is. You can't change the world. So just, you know, forget about it. You know, it's, you're not gonna change the world with your 10 friends, forget about it. Just go back, buy a car, you know. <laughs> Don't let people put you down with this because it's simply wrong. Factually, it is wrong. Things have changed in the past. And they haven't changed because of our politicians. They have changed thanks to us, the people. They, you know, small, very small actions added together that mm -hmm. created a huge movement. Do you really think, for example, that Rosa Parks, when she sat on this bus in Alabama in 55, thought that in a, you know, a few years later, Amer African Americans will have the same rights as whites? She didn't. She didn't, but she did it anyway. She sat on the bus. That's wrong, I'm gonna see on the bus. And that's the entire point. The point is about trying. The point is not about a future victory. Maybe there'll never be a victory. The point is about trying. Day-to-day -day actions. Standing up every morning, shaving. Actually, I don't shave, but if you shave in the morning, I still wash my face. Anyway, I, I, I talk to a mirror every morning, and you see your face, in, and you sort of think, okay, you know, not being proud of yourself or something, but you can look at yourself, yeah, at yourself in the mirror. Because change has happened. Change has happened, and it, again, thanks to us. So I'm going to finish, pretty much on like time, um, by quoting two famous activists, because they they say it better than I. Aida, uh, a character in John Berger's latest book that I highly recommend. Again, it's the second book I highly recommend. It's called From A to X. So Aida is writing a letter to her lover. Her lover is in jail. We don't know why, but he's in jail. And she says to her lover. Our parents thought we were fighting for our future, but we were only fighting to remain ourselves. And then the late US historian and activist Howard Zinn said in his highly recommended third book, uh, You Can't Be Neutral in Movie Train. And actually this is 
one of I think groundbreaking books that any mm -hmm. activist should read. You can't be neutral on a moving train. That's that's the type of book we should learn from at school, you know, and we don't. So Howard Zinn said, um, the reward for participating in a movement for social justice is not the prospect of a future victory. It is the exhilaration of standing together with other people, taking risks together, enduring small triumphs and enduring disheartening setbacks together. So really, that's, that's why I'm an activist and that's what, why everyone should be an activist. You know you want to be alive. Thank you. As we approach Christmas, a public holiday, and the time of celebration for people across the country, we must ask ourselves, as we are sitting here today, where is the holiday for the people of Iraq? Where is the holiday for the people of Pakistan, the people of Afghanistan, and the people of Palestine. But there are plenty of school holidays in those countries. There were no lessons in Gaza during Operation Cast Lead when their universities and classrooms were bombed by Israeli F-16 or when the UN school was hit with white phosphorus. There were no lessons for girls in Afghanistan, not under the Taliban we are claiming to be fighting against, nor under the corrupt Northern Alliance we have installed in their place. In Fallujah in Iraq on April 28, 2004, a crowd of 200 Iraqis gathered outside the secondary school that had been converted into a military base, defying a curfew imposed on the town by the American army and demanding that the school was reopened. American soldiers responded by opening fire on the crowd. Millions more across the globe have no education to have a holiday from. In 1948, 750,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes in what is now referred to as a Nakba or the catastrophe. But something else happened that year. Britain adopted the National Health Service as part of the birth of the welfare state. The same welfare state that the current government is so intent on destroying. However, just as the apartheid state of Israel from its birth tried to portray itself as a socialist state ignoring the fact that the land they were socialising belonged to someone else. The welfare state we began to enjoy did not include the welfare of the people living in the great British Empire and people from Sierra Leone to Iran continued to have their countries raped of their natural resources so that we could live in comfort. There is a reason why, if you travel to many of these countries today, it is cheaper to buy a gun than to buy a book. There is a reason why, in Palestine, during the Intifada, the Israeli army took over universities and turned them into detention centres and set up checkpoints to prevent students from attending their lectures for months on end. 
when I went back to Palestine this summer, I interviewed a man named Omar Kassis, a student at Birzeit University. One week after the interview, he was arrested and imprisoned by the Israeli army, charged with belonging to an illegal student society. Ironically enough, a society probably holding similar principles to the society that organised the meeting we are now sitting in. There is a reason why this is happening. Steve Biko, the South African freedom fighter, once said that the most powerful tool in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. It will be very difficult, for example, for hip-hop artists to rap about killing each other if they knew that all of humanity came from Africa. In the same way, it would be extremely difficult for anyone to believe the Zionist version of the history of the state of Israel if they knew the details of the ethnic cleansing that preceded that nation's birth. I remember interviewing a Palestinian hip-hop artist in Ramallah last year and he told me that he felt he needed to free his own mind before he could ever truly be free. The very idea that the people they are oppressing will educate themselves has always been a huge worry for the oppressor. It's difficult to accept imperialist policies as a status quo when you have read about the crimes imperialism and capitalism have committed throughout history.